I've got to confess, this video is for fun. I just needed a platform to talk about tarot superstitions. Okay, first one. Tarot is evil. Working with a tarot deck will invite in demonic spirits. Fact or fiction? If you're using tarot as a mind mapping tool to inspire your creativity to help you brainstorm solutions and to tap into higher consciousness to help you problem solve, then you're using the tarot pretty much the same way you use Google on your iPhone. You're using the tarot like a computing system or data processor. It's mundane. It's normal. Maybe it's a little artsy fartsy. But you know, tarot is probably about as evil as yoga or Harry Potter, a Himalayan sea salt lamp, or eating vegan. So if you believe yoga, Harry Potter, Himalayan sea salt, and veganism are evil, then I'm not going to win this debate with you. Tarot is an inanimate object. It isn't capable of being good or evil. But people are, and tarot readers are people. So maybe that's where things get a little dicey, because what if this dogmatic superstition contains a kernel of truth? Tarot functions on the power of the mind, and the mind is extraordinarily powerful. Given that, there are two ways the train can get off the rails here. First, what if you, the seeker, interact with an uninformed, unethical, irresponsible, worst case scenario, fraudulent tarot reader? For many circumstantial reasons, professional tarot is an unregulated industry, and at least from a legal or institutional standpoint, certification doesn't mean anything. You're not qualified or unqualified because of certification. In psychological terms, tarot amplifies the power of suggestion and can be wielded in arguably evil, malicious, or at the very least reckless ways that produce perception and manipulation. So if you, the seeker, are not grounded, shielded, and hyper-aware of what's going on, you could get led astray by a less-than tarot reader. Tarot readers should feel a great weight of responsibility on their shoulders when it comes to how they deliver their readings, how they approach reading for clients, and how to be an ally and protector. When a tarot reader is reckless and doesn't fully understand how words can create reality, a less than tarot reading can have potentially destructive effects. It isn't that a tarot deck invites in demonic spirits, it's that an irresponsible tarot reader does wield the power to inflict irreparable harm. In energetic or more metaphysical terms, tarot is an amplifier and it can be used to amplify and direct the energies of its user. And if its user is malicious or reckless, then that can be the energy the tarot amplifies and redirects out. If you're not equipped to be immune to that kind of negativity, then there can be adverse effects. Obviously, this situation is not unique to tarot, and swindlers appear everywhere in every form. But as I said, tarot operates on the power of the mind, whether you want to call that psychology or spirituality. So when people say tarot is evil, it's not that it's evil, it's just that you're putting a lot of trust in your reader. So that reader needs to be somebody who will handle you with care. The second point to be mindful of is how tarot can project back your deepest, darkest fears. The darkness isn't inherent in the tarot cards. The darkness is coming from you and the tarot is just a mirror that is reflecting back the true image of yourself. That can be disconcerting if you're not ready for it. In neither instance is the tarot evil. In both instances, tarot is nothing more than a truth teller about the human condition. It's kind of like how there is this one mirror in my house that I really dislike. And I always say it's a bad mirror because it totally magnifies my zits and pores and just, I don't know, I just don't look good in that mirror. So I'm like, that mirror is a bad mirror. I don't want it in my house. But come on, if I look into a so-called good mirror, does it mean my zits and giant pores no longer exist? Can I really dwell forever in the world of Photoshop and Instagram photo filters? If I avoid the bad mirror, then I won't get zits anymore. Is that right? Mirrors aren't good or bad, just like tarot isn't good or evil. Tarot, like the mirror, reflects back who we really are. And that so-called bad mirror is an important mirror to look at if I really want to clear my complexion and address the blemishes on my face. 
when I use the bad mirror to spot the issues and then address those issues head on by seeing my dermatologist, I solve the problem and the bad mirror is no longer a bad mirror because I can confidently look into that bad mirror and be like, dang, I look good. To me, grounding the novice tarot reader is such an important preliminary endeavor that I navigate you through some of the darker cards right up front at the start of Holistic Tarot. Be sure to review Chapter 3, Allaying Fears and Offering Theories, many times until you feel grounded about the matter. Now let's talk about evil as a religious concept and as an intellectual concept. Be wary of anyone who tells you something here of this earthly matter is only good, pure good, or positive only, just like you'd be wary of anyone who tells you something is pure evil or pure negative. Anything and everything you find here on earth is going to be a balance of both. Anything that represents itself as pure good or positive only is masking the evil from your view, and that should be very concerning to you. You want both eyes open. So to those of you who believe in angels, who subscribe to a religion where angels and demons exist, then tarot, or a deck of cards as a divinatory tool, can in religious and intellectual theory become a portal to both the angelic realm and the demonic realm. Again, just so we're clear, I'm addressing superstition with more superstition, but hey, for some of us, that's what it takes, right? The tarot deck, as an inanimate object, does not have the power to filter, block, or discern between the angelic realm and the demonic realm. Only you as a practitioner can do that. So it's never going to be about good or evil tarot decks because they're inanimate objects. It's about how you, the human being operating the tarot deck, navigate energies characterized as good and evil. How do you, the human, choose between courage and fear? So if you believe in angels and you believe in demons and you use the tarot, use the power of prayer or the repetition of mantras and envision such invocations as the production of an energy shield that will form a protective barrier around you and your work with the cards. That's how you can use tarot to connect to spirit or energies of the universe and block out any negative or darker energies from affecting you. You can also keep religious relics nearby to keep you feeling safe. Which tarot deck you choose, whether it's got a bunch of rabbits, sunshine, and rainbows, or it's a dark gothic deck, is never going to block out good or block out evil. Only you can do that with the power of your mind and will. If you do not take active ownership of that, then you leave yourself actually quite vulnerable to becoming unconsciously influenced by negative forces. That's why I strongly recommend that if you are religious, then use a balanced tarot deck so your eyes are wide open and nothing is concealed from your sight. You cannot address problems or fight toxicity that are concealed from your view. So addressing superstition with superstition to shield yourself and block out negative energies from insidiously influencing you Recite prayers to yourself prior to commencing work with tarot and visualize the luminescent energies of those prayers, forming an impenetrable barrier around you. Keep a consecrated religious relic close to your side as you lay out the cards. That is a far more powerful exercise than to simply find an airy-fairy happy deck that, quote, is a non-scary tarot deck, end quote, or a deck that has, quote, no negativity or evil at all, end quote. Next, we've got a tarot superstition that is super specific with the evil accusations. Another oft-heard superstition is that Aleister Crowley's Thoth Tarot is evil. The Thoth Tarot deck was created in 1938 by the controversial occultist Aleister Crowley and was illustrated by the artist Lady Frida Harris. My book Holistic Tarot does not teach the Crowley Tarot deck at all, so if you want to learn the Crowley deck, Holistic Tarot is not the book for that. Thoth is considered one of the prevailing tarot systems alongside Rider Waite Smith. Holistic Tarot is based on the Rider Waite Smith. The Thoth and the Rider Waite Smith are two entirely different tarot decks, and in fact, there was a bit of an interesting historic rivalry between Crowley and Waite. 
Crowley and Lady Frida Harris met in 1937 and began the undertaking of creating the Thoth Tarot in 1938. Lady Frida Harris would later go on to become one of Crowley's disciples. The two finished the deck in 1943. If you know your world history, the political climate during that time was a bit rough. There was almost undeniably a simmering darkness during that era. You witnessed the rise of jingoism, fascism, an assault on science, an assault on religion, social oppression, social divides, and the rise of Hitler to absolute authoritative power. World War II erupted in 1939, just one year after Lady Frida Harris began work on her deck, and the World War ended in 1945, two years after the Thoth Tarot was completed. In comparison, the earlier Rider Waite Smith Tarot was finished around 1909, and the global landscape prior to the two world wars was quite different. The decade when the Rider Waite Smith deck was being produced was one when Sigmund Freud was publishing his seminal works. Carl Jung, who Freud referred to as his adopted son, was publishing his research on psychology, the unconscious and the pathology of occult phenomena. And you've got the development of quantum theory in physics with Planck and Einstein. Art Nouveau was the popular art style during that time, which you can see influencing Pamela Coleman Smith's illustrations, a style that was both modern and eclectic. During this time, you also had the rise of spiritualism peaking between the 1840s and 1920s. And so the Rider Waite Smith Tarot, created around the center of that era, would have captured and reflected that collective social consciousness. Under the same theory of consciousness, then, the Thoth Tarot would have absorbed the collective energies from the times of World War II, especially as those forces would have culminated in Europe. Now, rationally, any argument for construing a single tarot deck as evil is absurd. The historical context is interesting, though, and spiritualists who are hypersensitive might be picking up on those distinctions of energy that are the remnants of historic and social influence. Add to that historical context the controversy that followed Aleister Crowley. Crowley was a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, then was in effect kicked out after he feuded with key members, including the poet W.B. Yeats. Crowley also gained a reputation for his sexual hedonism. Yet, by any account, Crowley was a brilliant mind, and the depths of symbolism, intricacies, and his experiential knowledge with the most occult models of ceremonial magic are the reasons why the Thoth Tarot is often considered an advanced practitioner's deck. The superstition of Crowley's Thoth Tarot being evil continues to linger, however. To this day, there are psychics, mediums, and well-known tarot readers who publicly distance themselves from the Thoth Tarot. Another myth is that the tarot came from ancient Egypt. Now, I don't want to act like I'm dispelling that belief outright, because the reality is we don't know. What historians seem to agree on today, however, is that the tarot originated from Renaissance Italy. What's interesting is a lot of things we think are European actually originated from Egypt, Lady Justice, for example, the iconic allegorical personification of the law and our legal system that is so present in the Western Civil Code, originated from the Egyptian goddess Mat and the depiction of Lady Justice balancing the scales as seen in the Book of the Dead. There are plenty more examples relating specifically to Judeo-Christian mythos that seems to source inspiration from ancient Egypt, but we won't get into it here since that can get touchy for people. So, is the notion that tarot comes from ancient Egypt a myth? From a documentary standpoint right now, we have to say yes, it's a myth. But hey, who knows? Now let's talk history. During the Renaissance, regular playing cards, which originated from China, were banned by the church. But because of the Christian imagery on the tarot and its association with wealthy aristocrats, such as the powerful Visconti and Sforza families in Italy, the church permitted the tarot as an exception to the playing card ban. That brings us to our next superstition. Some folks say that Christians cannot use the tarot because it is against their religion. The Bible says that God is against tarot. I am in no position and have no qualifications at all to tell you what is or is not Christian. 
And I promise you, I am not trying to change a mind that's already made up. But just as somebody who, you know, likes to read books, who's read the Bible and the Torah, and as someone who is an avid admirer of the historic Jesus, I'll throw in my opinion. So the Bible says you can't buy clothes at Target, Zara, Forever 21, or any of the other fast fashion retailers. What? Are you serious? Okay, I'm kidding. Well, half kidding. Much of the mass market clothing we buy today are made with blended threads, such as the combination of wool and linen. Yet it's pretty clear in Deuteronomy that you cannot wear clothes of wool and linen mixed together. Here's the thing with that, by the way. Historically, ancient Israelite priests of the tabernacle were the ones who wore blended wool and linen. Priestly garments were made of the wool and linen combination, so the prohibition for lay individuals against wearing blended threads was to separate the clergy from the commoner. Blended threads, it turns out, was actually considered godly, and you, my friend, unless you are a tabernacle priest, are not godly enough. Ergo, Deuteronomy. A few more fun insights from the Bible. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. That one is from Hebrews. Then there's Ephesians, for the husband is the head of the wife. Oh, and the husband head of the household thing is innocuous compared to Timothy. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And if a woman is not a virgin on her wedding night and her father has no way of proving that she was, then according to Deuteronomy, the men of her town must stone her to death. Fortunately, no stoning for men. Phew! If you're the man and you lied about a woman's virginity, you get fined 100 shekels of silver. Also, no divorces. Christians aren't allowed to get a divorce. The book of Leviticus offers lifestyle instruction, which I understand all Christians follow to the letter. You can't shave your sideburns and you can't shave off your beard. Right, here's the tarot one. You shall not get a tarot reading. Kidding, it's not just tarot. I mean divination, seeking omens, telling fortunes, all of it. Divination and seeking omens, more on that theme in a bit. But yeah, divination and seeking omens is as bad as shaving off your sideburns or shaving off your beard. Some of the Bible could have been written by Confucius. Case in point, respecting the elderly, filial piety. You know the Chinese are all about that filial piety. No wonder it was so easy to evangelize in Asia. Here's a bit about mediums and necromancers. So if you're going to see a tarot reader to summon the dead, then that seems to be squarely against the Bible. But what if you use the tarot to forecast the weather for tomorrow? I wonder if meteorology constitutes interpreting omens. How much of science is, in effect, interpreting omens? How I use tarot and the way tarot reading is taught in my book has nothing at all to do with summoning the dead. Holistic Tarot teaches you how to use tarot to synthesize logic and intuition for creative problem solving and to help you with personal decision making. You don't have to use tarot to summon the dead. It is entirely up to you what you will and will not use tarot for. Isn't that cool? Back to Deuteronomy. Translations matter. So here I'm putting up on the screen the ESV, NIV, and the King James. Oh, there you see it. There is the rule against interpreting omens again. There's a rule about leaving the dead alone. No necromancy and no casting spells. Hmm. I think I recall in the book of Luke and in the book of John, Jesus bringing the dead back to life. Book of John, Jesus casts a transmutation spell to turn water into wine. Book of Matthew, Jesus casts an abundance spell to multiply fish and bread. You know, it makes me kind of wonder if Jesus got the memo. Personally, I've never been big on the ESV or NIV. I'm an old school King James kind of girl myself. But for Deuteronomy, let's go back, way back to the original Latin Vulgati version of the Bible. The relevant phrasing is, well, let me put it up on the screen. I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Ariolos means to consult or consulting. Sisiteter translates to divination. Sisiteter is a noun. The verb form is sisitor, which means to inquire, to examine, to interrogate. The origins of the word sisitor is from sisko, which means to seek, to know, to ascertain. 
Divination, sisiteter, means to inquire, to seek, and to question. The message of Deuteronomy here is to not question and to not interrogate God, to not seek to know for yourself what God knows. That is the implication of divination and why divination is being barred. Another interpretation of that passage is a prohibition against questioning or interrogating the church to not seek to know for yourself what the church knows. So under the latter interpretation, if you seek out someone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens, then you are seeking out someone who challenges the priest's authority. See, the church wants a monopoly over the communication channels to God. So if a diviner outside of the church is practicing divination, which means receiving signs from God, that diviner is challenging the church's monopoly over the communication channels to God. Uh-oh, drums. Here's the thing. Diviners aren't really an abomination to God. The Bible documents God speaking to certain diviners and having them carry out his word, like Balaam in the book of Numbers. There's the prophet Elisha, a miracle worker who used magic or thaumaturgy and is venerated in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. If you read the Bible stories of Elisha, what he does sure sounds like witchcraft or ceremonial magic. There's also Moses, and then there's not only the three magi or three wise men who read the stars, astrology anyone, to prophecy the birth of Jesus, but then there is Jesus himself, a miracle worker. He was a healer. He also casted out demons and, well, performed exorcisms. If you take the miracles of Jesus as documented in the Bible seriously, then Jesus, in effect, was a practitioner of craft, especially thaumaturgy, which is related to ceremonial magic. And, of course, God seems to be okay with at least one specific form of divination, the Urim and Thummim. The Urim and Thummim symbolized the light and the dark and used that dichotomy of the light and the dark for divination. They were two, we believe, stones or pocket-sized objects that a high priest would keep in his breastplate and use to receive God's signs and omens through divination. Sidebar, in the Chinese folk tradition, we've got this thing called the Jiao Bei or divination moon blocks, which uses the dichotomy of the yin and the yang, or the dark and the light, for divination. The idea is you pray to a god and then use the two moon blocks to receive God's answer. Kind of an interesting parallel to the Urim and Thummim of Judeo-Christian tradition, isn't it? Here's how I interpret the Deuteronomy passage. If you adhere to the Holy Bible, Divination, or sisitator, the religious instruction here is against sisitor, which means to interrogate, to question. One way to interpret that, which is supported by the totality of circumstances and passages you'll find in the Holy Bible, is to not use divination to interrogate or question God. It's not about the church. It's about your direct and personal relationship with God and to defer to God. There's Acts 17.24, if you recall, which supports this interpretation of Deuteronomy. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. The figures in the Bible, like Balaam, Elisha, Moses, and Jesus, who weren't per se clergy affiliated with an institution of church, all read the signs and omens of God. As individuals, they connected to the unseen light and dark forces around us in the name of God and are under the good graces of God and could even speak to other humans for God. Plus, the priests of the tabernacle engaged in divination in its defined sense but again did so not to question or interrogate God, but to consult God, to commune with God. So what the Bible prohibits is the interrogation of God, not interrogation itself. Divination to commune with God outside of the church, and remember God, Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, isn't expressly antithetical to the Bible. 
That's presuming you even construe tarot as divination. Tarot can be used for divination, but it isn't only used for divination. In fact, tarot began as a playing card game, which the church permitted. If you're using tarot as a form of mind mapping to help you utilize creativity and intuition to make decisions, then that's not even divination, really. That's using tarot as a data processor. In other words, if you are a Christian, then a cogent argument can be made that God doesn't forbid use of tarot for divination for reading the signs and omens of God, so long as you defer to God. So if you're Christian, your use of tarot will defer to God and you don't use tarot to question or interrogate God. The God who made this world is of heaven and earth and does not live in the temples made by man. God, then, is present everywhere in the unseen forces around you, and you can use tarot to tap into those unseen forces to commune with God. You're not intending to use tarot to interrogate God. You're intending to use tarot to submit to God's will and asking for omens so that you can better carry out his will. And if you're not Christian, everything I've said is a moot point. Back to Bible verses. The Bible also says you can't eat at Red Lobster or enjoy barbecue. Leviticus was no foodie, I tell you. The book of Leviticus makes it pretty clear in its lifestyle rules to not eat shellfish or pork. So if you don't eat lobster bakes or barbecue because the Bible says you shouldn't and you don't wear clothing that has been woven from both linen and wool and you're ready to outlaw divorce, legalize stoning women to death, and you don't shave your beard or sideburns, then I hear you. Tarot is probably against your version of Christianity. Now, if you cherry pick what you want to listen to and not listen to from the Bible, then you've got to ask yourself, why do you specifically cherry pick the part in the Bible about mediums and necromancers? It's okay to cherry pick, but we should reflect on our own motivations. What is it about yourself deep down that you don't want to confront that compels you to psychologically project antagonism for one cherry-picked part of the Bible over another? So, can Christians use the tarot? That is a question each self-identified Christian must answer as an individual, guided, of course, by your God. And while you think it over, let's talk some more history and culture. At one point, tarot deck illustrations were used to impart church teachings and Bible stories. In the tarot decks of the Renaissance, key five of the major arcana was known as the Pope. It was later changed to the Hierophant in subsequent tarot decks. The Pope, which is renamed the Hierophant in the Rider-Waite-Smith tarot that Holistic Tarot is based on, is about divine authority here on Earth. And as A.E. Waite, the creator of the Rider-Waite-Smith tarot deck, describes the card, quote, the order and the head of recognized hierarchy. He is the channel of grace belonging to the world of institution, and he is the leader of salvation for the human race at large, end quote. And yes, those are the keys of St. Peter on a tarot card. This is key nine in tarot, called the Hermit card. The Hermit in tarot harkens back to the Christian theologian who chooses an eremitic life to demonstrate devotion to God. The Hermit is a monk recognized as a spiritual and pious man who chooses a solitary life of prayer. Of course, the archetypal figure of the Hermit is not limited to the Judeo-Christian faith. Buddhism, Sufism, Islam, Taoism, Hinduism, and religions around the world all bear reference to the archetype of the hermit, one who chooses to live as an ascetic for the cultivation of personal spirituality. Here, follow along in the video by turning to the Cyclopedia section of Holistic Tarot. There is some interesting recurring imagery between the Lover's Card and the Devil in the Rider-Waite-Smith Tarot. In the Lover's Card, we see imagery that will remind us of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, with Adam standing before the Tree of Life and Eve standing before the Tree of Knowledge. Here we also see the symbolism of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, close to Eve. 
in the Devil card, knowing that per Abrahamic mythos, the serpent in the Lover's card was the Devil, here we see the Devil with the lovers chained up beneath him. The Devil represents the primary opponent to God, a spiritual archetype that can manifest in our lives as temptations or oppositions that take us farther away from our highest goals or highest good. As Mary Kay Greer, one of the greatest tarot luminaries of our time, describes the card, the Devil can be a threshold guardian who appears in a reading in this provocative, rather triggering form to warn us of danger and to protect us from walking headfirst to danger. After the Devil card, which is Key 15, comes Key 16, the Tower. Pappas, a renowned 19th and early 20th century occultist who shaped esoteric tarot as we know it today, described the Tower card as indicative of the literal fall of Adam from Eden. However, Arthur Edward Waite, in his interpretation of the tarot, disagreed. So knowing that disagreement will inform the way you interpret the Tower card in the Rider-Waite-Smith tarot. Waite acknowledged, like Pappas, that Key 15, the Devil, and Key 16, the Tower, were related in the sense of chronology. However, Waite described Key 15, the Devil, as indicating the fall of humanity into materialistic and animalistic states, whereas here in Key 16, the Tower, catastrophe and destruction is related to intellectualism. Basically, the Tower card is about being too proud of your own intellect and beginning to believe that your intelligence rivals that of the mystery of God. Does that interpretation remind you of any particular story? The Tower of Babel is a well-known Bible story about how humanity, united as one by a single language, decided they would build a tower so tall it could reach heaven to establish the glory of man. Man's ego angered God, so he struck down the tower, scattered humans across the earth, and separated them with different languages. Thus, a popular generic interpretation for the Tower card in tarot is imminent catastrophe if you pursue glory and are driven by selfish, egocentric motivations. It is a reminder of humility in the presence of divinity, and when it appears in a tarot reading, revisiting your personal motivations and making some intellectual corrections or that revision of perspective may be in order. Here's an interesting twist, by the way. If you are a devout Christian, you might have a leg up over other tarot readers because you're already familiar with much of the religious iconography, symbolism, and context of the classical tarot imagery. Not every tarot reader who looks at the Tower card can see the Tower of Babel, so not every tarot reader is going to see the reference to a single language being split into many languages and the scattering of humanity. If, however, you look at the Tower card and see the Tower of Babel, then knowledge and your experiences will inform the way you read the Tower card. Given the historic origins of the tarot deck documented from the Italian Renaissance and the prevailing influence of the Catholic Church during that period, you actually see a heavy-handed amount of Christian iconography in the tarot. If you're using the Rider-Waite-Smith tarot deck, then you also know that its artist, Pamela Coleman-Smith, converted to Catholicism around the time she and Arthur Edward Waite published their deck. There are so many more examples of how Abrahamic scripture informs the tarot and guides the tarot reader on the path to wisdom that I'd really be going off on a long-winded tangent if I tried to cover them all in this video. So the superstitions that have created tensions between tarot and Abrahamic scripture seems, at the very least, to have been blown out of proportion.